the Denver Botanic Gardens are one of the great gardens in America today. There used to be not much of anything, a few rose plants at the city park. Today it rivals the great botanic gardens you see around the country. One of the powers of Denver Botanic Gardens is the fact that on just 24 acres in a very urban setting, we can shift your whole consciousness just by moving from one garden to the next. Part of what also makes this garden such a magical place are the wonderful structures that are here. They form a backdrop for these gardens and essentially create a series of outdoor rooms. It's a serene place. It's a place where all of Denver can come and walk and be quiet. For me, plants are, are my therapy, they're my business, but honestly, if you're gonna be addicted to something, what better thing to be addicted to? There have been wars fought over tulips. There have been economic collapses because of failure of coffee. So plants have always been integral, not only to life itself, but to commercial and social activity of human beings. Look at those tiny little plants and understand that they survive in the harshest of conditions. Maybe we can do that too. With inauspicious beginnings in a former cemetery, Denver Botanic Gardens would become one of the most spectacular gardens in America. Visionary architects, designers, horticulturists, and volunteers pioneered the way to connect people with plants in arid Colorado. The goal was to create a lush green oasis in the middle of the rugged urban terrain of Denver. This program was made possible by the History Colorado State Historical Fund. Supporting projects throughout the state to preserve, protect, and interpret Colorado's architectural and archaeological treasures. History Colorado State Historical Fund. Create the future. Honor the past. With support from the Denver Public Library, History Colorado, and the Colorado Office of Film, Television, and Media. With additional support from these organizations and viewers like you. Thank you. You absolutely have to be undaunted to garden in Colorado. Between our lack of water, hail, a number of uh, late snows, there are a number of things that make it a challenge to garden in Colorado. But when everything comes together, between our beautiful sun, our beautiful blue sky, there's no better place to grow a garden. People come to just walk and de-stress. If you stop a minute and pause a minute, slow down, hard to do, in this age, you begin to see your story in these spaces. It tells you a little bit about history. It tells you a little bit about sociology, about anthropology, about your connection to it all. We all, as humans, have a great need and most often a, a wonderful desire to be a part of nature. Not everyone can get up in the mountains all the time. Early on, there was this love of the outdoors in Colorado. That's what we know Colorado for. And having the botanic gardens as an expression of that love of the outdoors of Colorado was only a natural thing for the city to do. Our very vision from the beginning was to create something that was appropriate for our setting and that our setting was unique. The semi-arid continental climate that we have, there was simply no other garden that we could learn from. So we had to pretty much pull ourselves up from our own bootstraps. Colorado's high elevation and extreme weather poses many challenges for plant growers. It's this rich, rocky mountain habitat that spurred the early visionaries of Denver Botanic Gardens to cultivate a sanctuary to grow and study plants. A lot of people refer to a botanic garden, a, a show garden, a public garden, and they get all those terms kind of mixed up. Botanic garden's origins really are embedded in science. The first gardens were used to maintain collections from global exploration. A lot of it had to do with commerce. 
you found a new spice, or you found a new productive plant maybe for medicine, and you would bring it back and raise them and test them and trial them. Along came estate gardens, especially in Europe, that would really focus on aesthetics. They were all about beauty. There has been a tremendous fusion of those two concepts. The first botanic gardens in the United States was founded in Washington, D.C. in 1850. The seeds for a botanic garden in Denver were planted around the turn of the 20th century during Mayor Robert Spears' City Beautiful movement that resulted in grand parkways, public parks, and the planting of tens of thousands of trees. And it really came out of Spears' ideas for building a beautiful city here in the plains that had some of the attributes of a, of a beautiful place like Paris, and he wanted Denver to have parks and parkways, and part of that included a botanic gardens. But Colorado was a dry and desolate place to newcomers in the 19th century. Once described as the Great American Desert, people soon discovered this barren, seemingly infertile landscape would spring to life with one essential ingredient, water. When people started growing plants, they were astonished that once you put water, things would explode because our soils are actually very, very rich. Flowers thrived in Colorado's semi-arid climate of sunny days and cool nights. Greenhouses turned a budding industry into year-round profits. Colorado really did play a major role in the whole industry of cut flowers, and the focus was on carnations. They just grew very, very well here. So all of a sudden greenhouses started popping up and feeding a, a national, international market. Known as the Carnation Gold Rush, the flower industry thrived in Colorado from the early 1900s up to the 1970s. With that popularity came a groundswell of support for creating a botanic garden in Denver. The role of plants became something overwhelming to a number of people. They, they just were dogged in their pursuit of establishing the garden. And part of it's because there was a trend around the country of how do we understand, preserve, protect and display plants in a way that will inspire and delight. How do we do that? City Park was such a central part of the planning of the city of Denver that it was a natural choice to be the first Denver Botanic Gardens. This garden really grew out of the Colorado Forestry and Horticultural Association in the 1940s. It was 1951 that the gardens moved into City Park. And it was about 100 acres right next to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science today. The city hired the most prominent landscape architect around, Sacco de Boer, trained in Europe, master planner of gardens and also cities. Sacco de Boer was the godfather of landscape design in Denver, a brilliant landscape architect. He came from the Netherlands and experimented here in Colorado with plants that grew in other parts of the world. Sacco de Boer's 15-year master plan for Denver's first botanical gardens in 1952 was short-lived. Unfortunately, it didn't work out well because it was a little too public to the point where people were coming in the dead of night and digging up plants for their gardens. So we needed a place that could be a little more secluded. So the gardens began looking for a new home and it just turned out that there was a lot of very flat property just a couple miles to the south, a cemetery. The site originally where the York Street facilities are now was the first major cemetery in Denver. All of Cheeseman Park, the gardens, and moving toward Congress Park were all a massive, massive cemetery where thousands of people were buried. When it was decided that it would have to be located here, that involved removing a number of the bodies. And still to this day, occasionally bodies are discovered. This particular spot thus had a lot of kind of open, could we say fertile land. <laughs> this old graveyard would be reincarnated into a garden oasis thanks to countless volunteers, donors, and one enterprising woman who championed the gardens from the start. Ruth Porter Waring and a number of the early leaders of the institution really put their heart and soul into it. Ruth Porter Waring was one of the earliest inspirations for the gardens. It was Waring and some of her friends who wanted a place to not only grow beautiful plants but protect 
specimens that many of them had been collecting. The porters were early pioneers to Colorado and were involved in the creation of a number of important cultural institutions. So you look at somebody like Ruth Porter Waring, smart, vivacious, and really so devoted to what this institution could become. In 1958, as the Botanic Gardens was starting up, Ruth Porter Waring knew that they needed a headquarters building, and she purchased the house, which was next door to hers. Denver Botanic Gardens bought it for a dollar in order to own it, but you know, it was actually a gift. The house itself is one of the really great architectural jewels of Denver designed by Jules Jacques Benedict, one of Denver's best known architects. He attended the École des Beaux-Arts School in Paris. The house is a beautiful piece of Beaux-Arts architecture. Very eclectic, a number of styles pulled together to design this house. And as beautiful as it is on the outside, it's even more beautiful on the inside. The eclectic designs in all the frescoes, the architecture itself is so powerfully reminiscent of, of everything that was going on in the Roaring Twenties when it was built. It has a lot of Indian, Assyrian, um, Egyptian influences in the designs and the architecture. It boasts the usual Benedict Hallmark, the carved stone fireplace. If you walk around the house, there are just wonderful features, leaded glass windows, there are hand-painted murals that were done by the head of the art department at the time in the 20s at University of Denver. So there's a little bit of everything in this house. In the Waring House, we had the gift shop and the herbarium and the library and all the offices. Everything happened here because we didn't have any other office facilities. But it took another building, a modern architectural masterpiece, to transform the gardens into an icon. The origins of the Betcher Memorial Conservatory are embedded in an aspiration, big vision and big risk. There is not another conservatory like it in the world. In the early 1960s, the Betcher Foundation gave a generous gift to construct this. It was decided that the conservatory would be constructed in concrete because Charles Betcher made much of his fortune in the concrete business. The Betcher Conservatory is made of faceted plexiglass panels between interfaced concrete arches and an inverted catenary curve that arcs 50 feet above the tropical gardens. Even the lampposts and the surrounding walks and gardens aren't concrete trees, and the lights are the fruits on those trees. When it was built, it was the only tropical conservatory between Missouri and San Francisco. It's the only concrete conservatory in the United States, making it really unique. And it's the work of two architects, Victor Hornbein and Ed White. Victor Hornbein loved cathedrals and he loved nature and gardens so he brought together in concrete that whole idea of vaulted ceilings. There are pictures of the construction workers tied onto the side of this building. That was the only way they could stay safe, installing plexiglass windows and these really massive vaults. So I think really one of the challenges in constructing this in concrete is they essentially had to build the greenhouse twice. The first time out of wood and then the second time out of concrete. With the plexiglass and the concrete, the inside is very wet. It was built in such a way that the water with the condensation from the tropical conservatory would not stagnate and fall on people's heads, but it would go through the sides of each of those panels. The Bitter Memorial Tropical Conservatory, as the name implies, consists of tropical plants. And we have a large collection of orchids, bromeliads, aeroids, begonias. This is a way for us to showcase tropical plants in a very temperate region. Around 2,000 horticultural species are cultivated amid waterfalls and pools constructed in a sloped, naturalistic environment. Imagine this in winter and and the inspiration that it would bring to children and young adults and to all members of Denver society and uh, the citizens of Colorado and now the West. The gardens themselves are a treasure in many ways. The level of thinking and the level of craft in the original design is truly remarkable and something that I don't think exists in any garden in the United States. The original 
landscape architect, he designed the Denver Botanic Gardens as a series of rooms that had topography. So they were three-dimensional spaces, and he choreographed that around a wonderful notion between time and space and water. So it's an all-natural flow, and it's a beautiful choreography of mid-century modernism of shapes. I think there's a tension between the buildings and the various gardens that's part of the appeal. You know, it's a little bit like writing a sonnet where you have these things kind of jostling with each other. When you look at the 60s and then the 70s, every decade has been a wave of new gardens that really do have charisma. They are extremely special collections done in choreographed ways that really do transport you. You can be in the Japanese garden looking southeast and you think you must be in the mountains of Japan somewhere. A 1968 master plan included an ambitious Japanese garden. Famed architect Koichi Kawana was meticulous in crafting every detail, from hand-selecting each rock to having an authentic tea house built in Japan and reassembled in Denver. Since most native Japanese plants could not withstand Colorado's climate, local flora was substituted, fusing east and west in the midst of the Rockies. The Japanese white pine does not do well in Colorado, so we have created the Japanese aesthetic using our native tree, the ponderosa pine. And it is a four season garden, so even in the winter when people visit the gardens, there is something for everyone to look at. The 1968 master plan also called for a more familiar landscape, but nonetheless, a challenging one. In 1980, I was hired to be the curator of the Rock Alpine Garden. And when I started the first week or two, I mean, there was nothing here. In fact, I was pretty intimidated as I looked around and there were a lot of weeds. And I remember at one point I was pulling the weeds and I was looking and they were growing up behind me. But in 1981, it was breathtaking. The soils were so fertile and rich and the plants exploded. Of the 3,300 species of alpine plants on display in this garden, only about 10% are indigenous to Colorado. But these are the Rocky Mountain natives that can endure at 12,000 feet despite extreme temperatures and scarce water. Most plants below are thirstier. The fountain system that flows through and interconnects all of the gardens, that all was part of this modernist garden design that was developed in 1968. The waterways at Denver Botanic Gardens are extraordinary. They help tell a story about the importance of water in Colorado, and they do it in such a dynamic way. Almost all the water on the property is gravity fed. It begins at the four towers next to the pyramid, and it courses all the way through all the major gardens. So it's a parable, really, about the source waters of Colorado. In the mountains of Colorado, water is stored in annual snowfall and then makes its way down and eventually refreshes the entire southwestern United States. And it's just recycled. We're recycling the same water over and over. We do this as a way of conserving water, for sure, but we also use systems that enable horticulture staff to look at weather conditions, the state of, of their plants, whether they were just planted or their mature plants, and adjust exact amounts of water that are used on, on each garden. Irrigation is customized it's to make sure that they get exactly what they need. Plants are not objects. They are dynamic living creatures. The garden that you see today is not the garden you'll see next week. The trees will get bigger, the shrubs will change form, there will be different plants. So the real magic of a garden like this is that it will constantly evolve. All the plants that you see in a botanic garden are part of our living collections. So every single plant that comes into a botanic gardens are documented, and we have a database where we keep records. 
there was a lot of science that happened behind the scenes. We are always looking for new plants that are adapted to our Colorado climate. And so we look at other sister regions. We are in a region called the steppe climate region, the semi-arid shortgrass prairie. We have a newly created steppe garden which showcases uh, all the different steppe regions of the world, South Africa, Patagonia, Central Asia. We're about management of collections, we're about scientific research, but we're also about bringing those collections together in a way that delights and inspires our audiences. At uh, Denver Botanic Gardens, we have 40 plus gardens. When you first enter, you go into the romantic gardens. You're really in Europe. People, when they come to Botanic Garden, they kind of want the European traditional kind of garden. We've been able to showcase many, many kinds of plants that are, are really novel for Botanic Gardens in general. There's so many different flavors and styles. A lot of Botanic Gardens have one or two designers. It's kind of like all vanilla or all chocolate, but we have the entire Baskin Robbins, you know, uh, thing because so many different designers have been involved and so many horticulturists. And I think what has emerged in the actual garden itself has been an expression of the history of gardening really in Colorado. We started off with Europe, we eventually discovered our backyard, and now we're synthesizing those to make something truly unique. With only 24 acres available, the keepers of this garden always aspired to having more land. Soon after its founding, in 1957, they collaborated with the U.S. Forest Service to create a nature trail and garden 55 miles west of Denver at Mount Goliath. As you drive up Mount Evans and you hit tree line, there's a little hill there at about 12,000 feet high it's not a really a hill, it's a mountain, and it's one of the shoulders of Mount Evans. One of our founding fathers was a man named Walter Pesman. He was a Dutchman. He was a landscape architect, and he used to go up to Mount Goliath and lead tours. The trail that leads down Mount Goliath is named for him, and at that time, the trails were badly braided. We developed a partnership. Hundreds of people went up and worked on the trails to fix them and to improve the whole area. And so the Botanic Gardens now manages the gardens around the visitor center with the Forest Service. And we have a staff person who goes up there every week in the growing season and maintains things. Our role in, in Mount Goliath seems to increase with, with the years. We've been more involved than ever. Mount Goliath is the highest cultivated garden in the United States, and the gardens represent all the different habitats you would find in an alpine ecosystem. The gardens expanded their reach once again in 1973 when they acquired 700 acres of undeveloped ranch land. The Hildebrand Ranch added a new ecosystem to their diversity, the High Plains. German immigrant Frank Hildebrand homesteaded this spot just outside of Denver right after the Civil War. His family would ranch and farm here for nearly 100 years until the catastrophic South Platte flood forced them off their land. I remember vividly in 1965 living in the very southern edge of Littleton when this horrendous a storm hit and it flooded the whole Platte River Basin all the way out to eastern Colorado. The destruction was extraordinary and the Army Corps of Engineers came in and they, they decided to build Chaffield Reservoir. The dam was built really to control the floods along the South Platte River. Eventually, the Army Corps gifted that land to the Botanic Gardens to really have the land that they needed to enter a whole new type of experience, which was really an arboretum, a place specifically for growing of trees and tree specimens. You have the natural areas that really hearken to our agronomic and economic relationship to plants, which in a way really goes back to what Botanic Gardens started. When Chatfield first started, it was so vast. They kicked off their horticulture at a very high level, but they're not doing what we do. They want to do something different, and it's more hearkening to nature and naturalistic elements. They were such creative, incredible people. They started developing things that suddenly brought a lot of interest. We have gardens that support our community-supported agriculture program. We have beautiful lavender gardens that we've now built an entire festival around. We grow about 10 acres of pumpkins and 10 acres of corn for the annual corn maze and pumpkin festival. Last year, we grew about 25,000 pumpkins and had 45,000 people come and partake of the entire festival. This beautiful property, 
once condemned by the Army Corps of Engineers, has now been resurrected as Chatfield Farms. I think that what's really unique about Chatfield is that it's really become an urban farm. And they really stress the fact that we have this important connection with our farm heritage. And they want Chatfield to really honor that. One of the wonderful things also at the Chatfield Farms are the original buildings that were part of the ranch that you can see today. Beautiful homestead as well as a older school. It is so important for us to preserve them as they are since it conveys a little bit of history of a region and our old homesteads and the farming history of people coming here in wagons and settling down and creating an agricultural economy. In the early 1980s, Denver's economy was not flourishing as much as its gardens were. This economic turndown curbed attendance. To raise money, the gardens began hosting concerts in 1983. And for the first time since opening, they began charging admission. But still, it wasn't enough. So things were very tough, and that was my welcome mat as mayor of Denver. It was a very, very difficult time for all of the arts organizations in the metro area because when people lose income, they quit going to the facilities, attendance goes down, revenue goes down, and they were all struggling. Leaders of the four largest culturals at the time, so it was the Art Museum, the Zoo, Museum of Nature and Science, and the Gardens, got together and they started brainstorming because there used to be state funding that went into all of our institutions, and that was cut because of tough economic times. They began to really kind of pull it together. What if there was just a very small sales tax that could grow over time that could help support the operations of these cultural institutions? And they went forward. And in 1988, it passed uh, with a very high percentage of the entire population of the metropolitan area. And now it's been renewed three times after that. There is no other community in the country that can claim that. The Scientific Cultural Facilities District uses a one penny on every $10 tax to fund arts and science institutions that enlighten and entertain. Its $50 million annual budget makes an enormous cultural impact on all seven counties of Denver. So the idea being that my two cents and your two cents and everyone's two cents, pretty soon, aggregately, we're talking real money. We're talking a lot of money. Organizations like the Arvada Center, the Children's Museum, the Denver Center for the Performing Arts, the symphony, the ballet, the operas. Ultimately, it was to the benefit of all of Denver and certainly to the benefit of the Botanic Gardens, which was able to use that funding to really take the Botanic Gardens to the next level and build the world-class Botanic Gardens that we all know and love today. We had the second most visited Botanic Garden or Public Garden in North America last year and the year before. That's extraordinary. And we're swinging beyond our league because we have this, this foundational element of support that isn't just about the money, it's about the, the passion the entire state and especially the seven county area has for their cultural institutions. Part of the success of the Denver Botanic Gardens has always been public support and that really took off with the advent and the institution of the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District. The miracle of Colorado, really. And we have become a national model for the public funding of arts and culture. Denver Botanic Gardens today is an institution set to change the world. And that sounds audacious, I know, but it's actually happening. I can see it on, on a daily basis. We have an average of 1.3 million visitors a year. That's an extraordinary number for any cultural institution, but for a public garden, that is, that puts us in very, very rare air. We have 43,000 member households. We have 2,600 volunteers. When I first came to the Botanic Gardens, I came as a volunteer, and they bring so much experience and knowledge with them. We gain so much with our volunteers. The thing that's interesting is it just keeps growing and growing. It's a sign that this garden is really, really loved by, by Denver and our community. The life of an institution like this is really about thinking about the future, because we're not just one building, we're an entire campus. Things change. Plants are living things. There's constant movement. It's a dynamic force. 
50 years after its founding in 1951, this ever-evolving institution created a new master plan for a new century. But even while looking forward, they maintained a tremendous respect for the past. The ability to be involved in historic preservation has been the foundation of everything we do because it reminds us of where we've come from and it recommends where we might be going. All of the work of David Triba was so thoughtful in how it incorporated that mid-century modern aesthetic throughout everything that we have. We wanted to set the guidelines and standards for the preservation of place in the context of anything new with the old and honoring that past, but we knew that there would have to be change. The gardens in the mid-60s was very insular, so the buildings were heavy and masonry or concrete and, and inwardly focused, and throughout the, the time of the master plan and design, we decided to change and open that, so what was previously hidden in back of the house became front of the house. One of the most exciting parts of the project was the transformation of Marnie's Pavilion. We opened that up and reconnected it, and it became really the central hub of the gardens. And so it was that particular context where we began to think about how we enhance the entry and arrival, and where do we park the cars, but how do we operate and service the gardens. And to do that with grace and to do that in the, in the mission of the gardens, which was to connect people with plants from that moment of arrival. The parking structure was conceived as a garden in and of itself. We nestled it not only down below the street level, but at street level and above street level, and we created the largest green roof in Colorado, over an acre of green roof, and it became the Mordecai Children's Garden. So even if you're just moving through the city, you're highly aware of the gardens. You're passing right through the center of the gardens. New and old live comfortably together here, with change always respecting heritage. Thank goodness in Colorado there's a powerful ethic of historic preservation. Because when you see a house like the Waring House, it has historic status. When you have a building that old, all the systems are tough to fix. And with the support of all kinds of friends, including the State Historic Fund, we've been able to not only maintain the house, but to, to really set it up for decades to come. One of the first things they had to do was deal with a leaking roof. They actually had to start several years in advance finding this historic green roof and stockpiling it so that when they undertook this project, they had the roofing material that they could use. In addition, the Botanic Gardens undertook the restoration of some of the interior decorative finishes such as the frescoes. The building today sparkles and shines just as beautifully as when it was built in the 1920s. One of the phases in the Master Development Plan was the restoration of the Veteran Memorial Conservatory. And when that was completed for its 50th birthday, I don't know that anything made me prouder of the work that we've done over the last decade, because you could see it gleaming like it did when it first opened. It was very intricate work. Every inch of that concrete had to be scraped and checked. For a while, it looked like some kind of circus performance up there, because you had all these these people dangling from ropes. Less acrobatic, but nonetheless challenging, was the design of a new state-of-the-art science and education center. The new building is totally reflective of the mid-century modern aesthetic, using elements from all the rest of the architecture on the campus. In fact, there is a skylight over the atrium that is the same design as the diamond points of the Betcher Memorial Conservatory. So it is extraordinarily respectful of all the architecture that's come before. Although built for the people of Denver and its visitors, the Denver Botanic Gardens now have an international reach. Through the Denver Botanic Garden Center for Global Initiatives, we are looking at connecting people with plants on a global scale. We have had staff who have done plant exploration in Argentina, South Africa. We bring back plants and we test them for their adaptability to the Colorado landscape. But here's where it gets really exciting. We're working in the area of food and farming, of water conservation, water storage, trying to find new alternatives that we can roll out on a global scale. That, that really could shift how people live. 
and it's triggered something in many people around here. And, and that is the confidence that a small collection of people really can change the world. So the legacy of the gardens is really a gift to the future. We want to bring more than just flowers. We want to bring science. We want to bring art, water, research, plant diversity. We also want to make sure that everyone has access to the gardens, that every school child can come here to learn and get inspired and have aha moments. When I walk around the gardens now, it used to be you'd see mostly older people, but that's not true anymore. I, I think a lot of the people who are coming here are young, and that fills me with hope. I think young people are pretty smart, and I think this is a, a very romantic place to bring a date. You know? <laughs> They're constantly dealing with technological things, and we're kind of the antidote to a lot of the problems that we're facing in our society. We see people that come in and they look like they're carrying the burdens of the world on their shoulders. They begin to wander around the gardens. The sound of nature, the smell of nature, the sight and touch of nature begins to lift some of that burden. Perhaps the most exciting thing when you look back on the, the legacy of the Denver Botanic Gardens over all these years of struggle, it's like a plant in this environment, how much we have to struggle in Colorado with all of the forces of nature against us, that we've survived and the gardens has thrived. Teaching people about the importance of not only protecting our environment, but also valuing the historic buildings that are part of our heritage. I see a hundred years from now uh, uh, more botanic gardens, not just the way we have them now, but as part of communities. We will not just have botanic gardens as little isolated pockets, but where they permeate the entire community. When you understand that life transforms oftentimes in these small ways, you realize the power of an institution like the gardens. Because even though we have these big dreams and big visions and really want to make a difference in people's lives and their understanding of science or their use of water, we know that at its core, that reconnection to nature and to beauty is the most powerful thing that we can do.